Shabbat Shalom again. It's Yalak here. Another lesson in the New Testament is fake series. This is April 22nd, 2017. Thank you for everyone who's been um, showing support and listening to my videos. I thank the Most High for your really wonderful words. Um, it seems more and more people have been contacting me and uh, expressing how thankful they are to find my lessons and uh, uh, surely there have been those who have cursed me out and so on more of the people who have contacted me however have been thankful and encouraging so i'm thankful you know I, they say if most people are cursing you then you might have a palm but if a little is doing it and more people are with you then that's good and so that has been my experience i thank the most i for your comments again and uh, I'm not able to respond as quickly to uh, everyone. Um, I, I try to really respond as quickly as I can, but um, the communication is increasing, uh, even though I'm at such a young stage with these videos on YouTube. It's starting to grow a little bit more, and I'm getting uh, communication on Twitter where I'm at, and... Uh, on the YouTube web page, plus I'm getting also um, more and more emails, and I'm just not um, not able to get to them as quickly as possible. And uh, I'm just going to try to do my best to respond to you. It's not because I'm ignoring. Anyway, I want to do this lesson today entitled "I Am One Year Old." Looking here from Exodus chapter 12, 3 to 7, where we're talking about the Passover. I just want to mention quickly, as I ran a search online, this question came up is, um, if Jesus is our atonement, why did he die at Passover instead of the Day of Atonement? A question I'd asked many, many, many videos ago, sometime last year probably. And there are clever answers to this question, as there are clever answers to probably most, if not all, the things you can read of. But um, I think what I try to do is to come from a common sense point of view. And uh, I've, you know, come across some people who are using this approach as well, where they mingle the scriptures with common sense. And that's what I... I did when I when I first started these videos. I uh, I just noted people just talking from the scriptures alone, but I'm finding more people throwing in some a lot of common sense with the teachings as well. Because when you deal with common sense, you deal with getting the mind back to how it should function, or as close to it as you can. Because uh, as I've said before, the New Testament lets you think that spiritual warfare is up in the heavens and um, you're fighting spirits so you got to do an all-night prayer meeting and you got to fast uh, come together in fasting and prayer and try to bind this spirit and bind that spirit that you don't see but what i found as i've said before is the spiritual warfare has to do with your teachers the teachers who are not teaching properly because this world is a word world you know the, the it's a word world you read in the bible that the most i just simply said let there be, let there be, let there be. And that's how it really happened. Look again here from Job chapter 38 verse 12. Has thou commanded the morning? And um, again, you're dealing with word. You're giving a command. You're speaking the thing, right? Has thou commanded the morning since thy days and caused the day spring to know his place? Torah is about words as well. Words that give you wisdom and direction in your life. Psalm 33 verse 9, For he spake and it was done, he commanded and it stood fast. And so what we find here is that this is a word world where the Creator speaks things into being and uh, they happen as he has said it, which is why you've also got a lot of prophecies in the Bible. Many have been fulfilled. There's more happening right now and more is going to come um, in the future, meaning more is going to be fulfilled in the future. And so when you deal with word, you also deal with mind because the understanding of words would need to happen in the mind so that you can tell what's going on. You can find meaning. 
and life in those words such as like in the words that are written in Torah so Torah is like a, a main word you know like one big uh, word that envelops all the other words that are spoken to us to convey an idea of what the Creator wants what he's about, what he expects of us, and how he wants us to live, and so on. So the common sense approach is dealing with that, because the real warfare is not binding some spirits that you say are attacking you, and attacking your church, or fighting against your camp, and so on, or fighting against you in life in general. The, 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 the war is a war of words, and happens with teachers who teach the wrong things. Right now, anyone can teach something wrong and be wrong. But if you are honest in your heart before the Most High, before people, and you're searching, when you find the truth, you're gonna make the corrections. But then you got these other uh, people who are more put in the the part of darkness now, where you deal with the sons of light and the sons of darkness. Those sons of darkness, they just capitalize on the lie. They bring deception because it is their main function or focus. They could have sold out for money or sold out for whatever other reason or they're just doing it for hate they hate you um, or they hate the creator they got these sons of darkness that are teaching these lies and uh, all the people who are teaching this jesus messiah stuff in the hebrew camps um, if you're teaching it just because that's what you've known, that's what you learned, and that's what you see, that's kind of different, although it's still wrong, but that's kind of different because, you know, once you see it, then it's expected that you will turn. But then, when I, when you hear me talk about the camps, um, I'm more focusing on the camps that, n who know it is wrong because they have covered it in their personal studies, in their personal life, and don't give a fuck about you. Because they will not stop building the, the, what they've built it so that they don't have to go to work and work a nine to five job like you do. Ah, those are the people, I'm those are the camps I'm talking about. I'm not just talking about the camps in general that teach this Messiah stuff. Although to a little extent, yeah, yeah, it includes them because everybody's got to drop this Jesus Messiah thing. But uh, uh, when I say the camps, mostly I'm talking about the, the, the real strong ones that just bulldoze over you they shut you down they hang up on you they curse you out and they're more boisterous on the street things like that and so the the warfare is with your teachers religious leaders that they bring the war and the sword is the word that they speak and so it's a fight of words it's a fight of words you know sometimes you look at um you look at certain wars in history and there'd be some negotiation, and then if the words don't work, then they'd just come and bring the swords and the weapons and kill. Because it's really a war of words, but then if, if you don't buy into the word, then we just kill you. And so the spiritual warfare then has to do with the word. So you have to do something with the mind. And so my common sense teaching, as I use a, whatever stories I can find, and a lot of, you know, just general basic common sense kind of language to let you see that your mind, when it begins to function properly again by being exposed to common sense, everyday kind of thinking, you will begin to find your way out of the deception of this Messiah that the Creator never sent. And has nothing to do with him. And at this point, I'm not even sure that Israel should be looking forward to a Messiah. Yeah, I know that catches your attention. But you see, I'm learning and growing as well. I'm learning and growing as well. And so, you know, maybe in the early stages, I would have thought that, yeah, some Messiah is going to come. Um, I'm working on that. I'm going to expose some things about that um, in time. The Most High is just the only Savior. He's the only one. Now, if you mean Messiah in terms of the Most High coming and gathering us, yeah, that's, that's different. And if you are saying David's going to come back and, and reign, that's different. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about some kind of uh, a Messiah that they were saying died 2,000 years ago. That's what I mean, that that's the one that we're not supposed to be, be dealing with. And so Israel shouldn't be looking for a Messiah like that. So now... When the mind functions properly, you can process the information that's given to you by your camp or by your church or by any religion that's teaching about this Jesus or any savior that you have in your other religions. And you can begin to find your way now to, to the Most High by searching for truth. So I present the common sense kind of um, information to, to kind of bring your mind back 
get back in the middle so that you can see why you were over on that side to begin with and then you can see where you really should be now i am one year old i'm going to read from exodus chapter 12 verse 3 to 7 here's what it says speak ye unto all the congregation of israel saying in the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb according to the house of their fathers a lamb for an house now first of all right here every man should take a lamb so now if you say that jesus is your lamb then shouldn't every israelite watching the romans kill him even though it was as i said before a israelite high priest that should excuse me be right there an israelite high priest should be slaying the lamb and officiating the sacrifice but a Roman soldier kills your Jesus lamb and you think that's kosher? See my video, Calvary is not kosher. These camps know this stuff and they don't care. There is nothing that can be said that will take that point down. Nothing. I don't care what they want to say to you. They're going to give you some fancy kind of stuff because, you see, what I've identified is that since this is a, a world of word, and since the Bible is about words, then if one is skillful enough in the wickedness of evil teachings from the sons of darkness fighting against the sons of light, then all one has to do is just simply say the dark words that sound good to the ear. Don't politicians do it all the time? They come and they speak all kinds of stuff to you in their rallies all the time that they're going to do. And when they get in power after you vote for them, they don't care. You're looking to Obama to do all kinds of stuff for the black people there in America, and he didn't care shit. So, if one is skillful enough, you can just use the words to tell a lie in a way that makes it appealing to the hearer, and then they'll hook you if you are not careful enough. Because this is a world of words, and these words can be used for good or for evil. And so, that's why you need common sense, because common sense will will see that what they're doing to tell you to continue to believe in Jesus and this Calvary is not kosher stuff is garbage, they're going to find some expert way to tell you that that's not correct. It's all right if the Roman soldier killed him because anybody can kill him. He's still the sacrifice. That is garbage. Common sense will let you know that the precepts do not show that the sacrifice should be killed by people from other nations. But the skill... And the learning of many years of Torah training and understanding and dozens and dozens and dozens of books that they have. Um, so, you see, when they, when they have all this knowledge of Torah, for years before I even came into this Torah knowledge, they can find all kinds of ways to, to answer a question to you. Come on, think with common sense, people. Just because someone sounds smart and clever does not mean it is right what they're telling you. Otherwise, no Israelite would have had a problem in the Old Testament with priests who were deceiving them. The Most High himself said time and time again that the priests were corrupt. The leaders were corrupt. The priests were corrupt. Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 1. Woe be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pastor, says the Most High. So these are leaders that are scattering the sheep. They're leading them the wrong way by word because it's teaching that pastors or leaders would do unto Israel. Verse 2, Therefore thus saith the most high power of Israel against the pastors that feed, whose feeding is dealing with word, they're teaching you, that feed my people. Ye have scattered my flock. How do they scatter? They scattered by word that they taught. They were skilled in the word and they know the dumb Israelite who's not trained in Torah because they can't own their own scrolls either. They are going to believe anything that the priest and the pastor and the leader says because one, they got the power and two, they got the clout and three, they got the money and four, they got the prestige and five, they got the status in the land and six, the word was given to them to teach. And so it's their job. And so 
in your job, you do stuff every day, every day, every day. After a while, you get real skillful. Someone brings their car to you and they're telling you all kinds of stuff. You just want them to shut up, just leave the key because, yeah, you already know. You know exactly where to look for that kind of palm. You, you can just tell. And sometimes you say, I need to look, but, but you still have an idea where to start looking because you're skilled. You do that job every day. So when they are skilled at Torah, they've got them. Believe me, they sit down and they work out all kinds of answers from beforehand when they hear the next teaching from any one of us online and they figure out and they plan and they scrutinize and they whatever to figure out how to take down that teaching from the next person because they're not going to lose you out of their evil wicked camp with their demonic jesus messiah teachings they prepare from beforehand and they strategize and they employ evil tactics in order to take down the people who are teaching the truth they go behind the scenes they use underhanded means so ye have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not visited them behold i will visit upon you the evil of your doing saying the most high and I will gather the remnant of my flock from all countries. Okay, let's go down some more. Look at this. Same Jeremiah 23 verse 11. For both prophet and priest are profane. In other words, that means that they are polluted. Right? So something has gone wrong. They've corrupted themselves. Yea, in my house. So see, have I found their wickedness saying the most time. In my house. What kind of wickedness is he going to find in his house? The wickedness has to do with words. So deception was in the house of the Most High, in the midst of Israel, because of the prophet and the priest, whose job was to lead and teach and guide and inspire the people according to their inspiration that they received from the Most High. So because someone is a camp leader or someone is a priest or someone is a prophet, and they look like a prophet the same way Isaiah looks like a prophet, doesn't mean they're not going to deceive you. You don't judge truth by what comes out of their mouth. You judge truth by what has been given by the Most High, starting way back at Sinai. And before that, with the other teachings that he dropped in his revelations to the other people he was dealing with before, of the children of Shem. You see that? Because Sinai is just the coming out of Israel, kind of, might I put it this way, reintroduction to Israel as they're being setting up now as a nation. Not just some loose scattered people in their individual journeys and so on but both the prophet and the priest so someone can look to you online teaching and in their camp that they set up on the street with their elaborate pictures and so on but they can still be corrupt so to look like you got it all together does not mean shit to look like you are teaching this with with 25 35 years doesn't mean and to say to you, who's that brother right there or that sister right there that's teaching that Messiah stuff? Who raised them up? Who passed on to them? You know who passed on to us? The brothers that were in this, the elders from 60 years ago and 70 years ago. They, we trained under them. Well, who the fuck did they first train under? They had to have been a first person. When the Most High called Abraham, who taught him? You tell me, yeah? Well, who taught the person before him? Who taught Adam? Nobody taught Adam the Most High. He came to him and visited him in the garden to deal with word. It's a word world. When he came to Adam, he didn't sit down and play Ludi and Domino and all that stuff and cards. He came and talked to the man because this is a word world. It runs by word. And he gave him word of instruction. And the enemy, knowing that he's got a right word to live by, a word of instruction, came and gave a different word that they call the serpent or the snake so that the man will lose the first word. You see that? This is not no spiritual warfare of some invisible demon in the sky that you got to bind with all night prayer meeting. This is a war of words. And so the war went on now with the so-called serpent who was somebody from another nation who gave words, wicked, corrupt words, to take down the man and the woman in the garden because this is a word. And he sounded like a skillful serpent teacher, a skillful snake teacher, a skillful teacher, but a teacher of what? Words. And he made it sound so good that he took the woman down and she gave to the man and he did eat. The same way that the scripture is saying here that they caused Israel to eat. They, they fed Israel the wrong thing. So both prophet and priest are profane, he says. 
And verse 13, I've seen folly in the prophets of Samaria. So again, more prophets. They prophesied in Baal and caused my people Israel to err. And the same thing is going on again where these returning Israelites are going the wrong way because of the teachers that are, are captivating them on the streets or online or wherever they're finding them and uh, causing them to still err by keeping coming over to this Israelite knowledge but still keeping the Christianized Roman Messiah doctrine, which didn't start at Rome. Rome just simply rebranded it for their time. In verse 14, they cause them to walk in lies and so on, strengthen the hand of evildoers and so on and so forth. Okay, so you can read the, verse, the rest of verse 23. Verse 23 deals with the evil teachers, the wicked pastors, and the priests and so on, the prophets, the leaders in general, right, that are not teaching the truth. And so you got to see right there that when he's saying here in Exodus chapter 12, verse 3, that they should take to them every man a lamb according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. When you've got common sense, because I focus on common sense application of this, uh, of, of what you're reading to, to your mind, apply it to your mind so that you can run around in your mind and show you the truth. When he says every man a lamb for, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house, plain old common sense breaks away from their lies to letting you understand it's a lamb for everybody's damn house. You know your house? You're going through the front door? That's your house. Put one lamb there and the next man goes to his other door in his other house. That's another lamb for that other house. So why is it that every Israelite did not bring a Jesus or a Messiah to be strung up by the Romans on Calvary's cross? It should be many Jesus. So then the father should be saying, hey, I need to send more Jesus here, more sons, because... One can't do for everybody because the precept that I've already given and God does not lie, the Bible says, says a lamb for every house. So if Jesus is your lamb, don't I need one as well? And you want to laugh and say, hey, hey. but when they're telling you the garbage, you buy into it. Well, why can't you buy into the truth? Like it is said, buy the truth and sell it not. And if the house, verse 4, and if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your account for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. He shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. Now listen to this commentary that's talking about this. In the Passover, it says, uh, to not read all of it, it says, the, the, the victim, meaning the lamb, should be without blemish and uh, that means it should be ritualistic, uh, ritually perfect. We know the whole thing of blemish already. We know what that means. So it should be ritually perfect. And it implies inspection both before and after the killing. That's how they did it back then in the Old Testament. Who inspected Jesus before and after he was crucified as the so-called Lamb of God? Did anybody strip and look at him to see if he is perfect? Ritually perfect and so on. But they just tell it, no, he was spiritually clean because he was a son of God. He should have been inspected. Okay, let me jump to verse 7. And they shall take off the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door posts of the houses wherein they shall eat and so on. And we don't see any of that than people taking Jesus' blood to strike it on anything. And their door posts and so on, right? They say, oh, well, it's on the door of our heart. I don't know, they give you some clever things, right? Some clever responses. Why? Because it's just a war of words. And the smartest one that can get you an answer quicker, you run with that because you will, it sounds so smart that you stop searching, you just run home. And it's hell for anybody to remove that from your mind, even though it was wrong. And these experts that are teaching this Messiah stuff, and again, I'm talking about not the ones who just genuinely believe in Jesus, which is still wrong. I'm talking about the ones who are such experts at deception now there are two experts i want to identify here the camps who are experts at, at this because they've studied it for so long and they can tie in the old and new testament together that's esoteric teachings that tie them together because new testament don't have the shit to do with old testament it's esoteric teachings that's in the new testament that makes jesus look like a son of god that came to the israelites to die for their sins Esoteric, because esoteric deals with basically hidden things. And when they were making up this Messiah gospel initially in Egypt and before Egypt, and then the, the Greeks and the Romans doing it as well, they did it in hidden rooms. They were hiding and doing it and setting it up, and then they rolled it out and made the book for it called the New Testament. So that's that's esoteric stuff. So so there's those 
expert teachers who are experts because they've been well trained in in the Hebrew and the Greek and in the knowledge of the Old Testament and in the history of the New Testament and so on. Those ones are different. They're, they're experts, but they're genuine. They just genuinely believe this like I genuinely believed it in the Christian church all the years of my life and coming into the Israelite teaching. But then I'm identifying the other expert group who are just experts at deceptions. They're not just believing this because they just genuinely believe it. They might have started to believe it initially many, 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 many years ago. But they came to the point where they understood that it is wrong. Biblically, it's wrong. Torah-wise, it's wrong. But they refuse to drop it off because they love deception. They want to cast darkness over you because they are of the sons of darkness. And the Hebrew garments look fine and tight and everything is nice, but they are the sons of darkness. So now, listen to this. More and more of us are choosing not to bother with these scams because they're just there's too much confusion there. But while some don't like me to say it, and, and some actually try to get me to not, now I still think there are some nice scams out there, and I've seen some. And, um, you know, so I'm not going to deny that, and I'm not telling you don't be a part of a camp. I'm just saying. It also does not mean that you can't be a part of a camp that's teaching um, about the Messiah. That's not what I'm saying either. Because if your teacher just can't see it, because he has strong belief in the New Testament and the Messiah, that, that's different. It's still wrong, but it doesn't mean that everything your teacher teaches that's wrong, you're just going to leave your camp because of it. No, that wouldn't make sense either. So that's not what I'm saying. Don't think I'm just hating every camp teacher out there. I learn from every one of them. So, you know, and that's the point I want to make here now is that if you don't belong to a camp, you still likely got your information from them initially when you started out. Even if they were going to lead you astray in this or that doctrine, that's not correct and so on. And then you learn as you go on. But even the people who are telling me that they, they don't believe in these camps, they research camps all the time. They learn from the camps. They watch the videos. They learn from them. So, yeah, you might not be a part of a camp, but you're still you're still learning from the camps. You're, you're, you're learning some of the tougher stuff that's not so easy to figure out. Like, it's a hell of a time for me trying to learn of this, um, uh, the some of the holy days when they've fallen and so on. Like, there's so many different stuff out there, and um, I'm starting to give a little bit more attention to it now, but it, it really takes the time, right? It takes some time to, to learn stuff. But, you know, we still all learn from them. But the, the point is that the wicked ones, they tricked you as this Jesus sacrifice. Apparently, it, it would seem more fitting to me to be the Day of Atonement, Right? But I don't find where, a, if Jesus is a lamb for for your for your sacrifice, your part, let's say you're 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 bringing a lamb for um, day of atonement, or a goat or a bird, or whatever you're bringing, right? That same lamb was not used for Passover holiday or another holiday when it came up. It wasn't used. A different lamb or, or bird or so was used. Yet these smart camps are going to try to tell you not to listen to me because he was both your Passover lamb and your, your Day of Atonement sacrifice at the same time. Where do you find any precept in scripture? And these camps are big on precepts because there's where they are where I learned of precepts from. I knew the word in Christianity but didn't care. But they're big on precepts. But they're going to tell you don't listen to that. Jesus is your your lamb for every holy day sacrifice because the New Testament says so. Yet I can find no precept that they've ever read that shows me that I should build a case for having Jesus be the same sacrifice for everything. Because when an Israelite man took up a lamb to go and offer it and took it to the priest for a certain holy day, he didn't take that same lamb and offer it again the next holy day. It's dead and gone. Long time. Dead, they ate it and threw the bones away and all that. So they find another one. Why is Jesus used as the same lamb if he is the lamb? And then get this point as well. Well, before I go on to that, a lamb that died as a day of atonement, on the day of atonement for that sacrifice, was never called the Passover lamb when the next Passover came. It was a different one-year-old lamb, right? And, and keep in mind here, that the scripture plainly, plainly said that it should be one year old. Why wasn't Jesus crucified as a baby, killed and slaughtered as a baby at one year old? It's like all these Jesus Messiah teachings. 
just seems to break from as many, many, many precepts as possible and stuff it down your throat and tell you, swallow that. And if you don't like it, drink some lemonade with it that's nice and sweet, but it's got to go down some way. They tell you all the expert things that they've studied about precepts. And when somebody else comes and show the precepts, they don't give a damn. They raise their voice at you and they talk over you and then they move on from it. Telling you, we got another lesson here today, sister. We taught that already, brother. One year old lamb. Jesus was 33 and a half years old when he died. Went into public ministry at about age 30, the main part of his ministry there. And uh, within three years, they decided to kill this man because his judgment was coming upon him in the story. Then he supposedly rose, stuck around for a few days, and then disappeared. And the people at the time, the apostles at the time, knew for a fact based on history that he was coming back very quickly. They expected him so soon. These righteous, spirit-filled apostles that were getting their information direct from the spirit and could give you word of knowledge and so on. These Christians back then, who were Hebrews, Israelites, knew he was coming back so quickly that they kept talking about Maranatha, Maranatha, soon, soon, soon. That they even walked down the street, historians say, they would walk down the street even looking up to the sky because they said that he said the same way, the angel said the same way you see him go, he's going to come back. And they expected it so soon based on the spirit knowledge that gave them the knowledge in their spirit that he's coming back soon. They knew he's coming very soon in their lifetime. So they walked down the street looking up to the sky, expecting him to burst the clouds and come out any moment. And we're 2,000 years later. What kind of credibility does that give them? But at 33 and a half years, he doesn't connect with the one-year-old stuff. First of all, he needed to somehow multiply himself or have his other brothers come because the father needed to send many more sons so that each Israelite house could have one lamb to themselves or so. So he's breaking from all that stuff. He's not no one-year-old sacrifice, lamb sacrifice. And, uh, you know, it's really, it's really crazy. Now look at this point. The New Testament tells us and the New Testament teachers back then and today, tell us that this Messiah is the Lamb of Calvary, the Lamb of God. And so he could die for a place by taking the place of the lambs in the Old Testament, even though everybody should bring a lamb. So every Israelite should have been bringing Jesus. So that don't make any sense as far as my common sense needs to operate in my mind to let me know that I'm, I've got a functioning, sane mind like the Creator expects us to have because that's what he gave us in the first place when he made man he didn't make an idiot he made a man that had common sense that's why eve listened to the serpent from another nation that was living at the time of adam he list she listened to him because she had common sense to know it was wrong now adam he didn't bother with the common sense she gave to him and he did eat but she was listening because she had common sense and she knew, uh-uh, what you're saying, it doesn't sound right. So she's going back and forth in her mind. She's trying to rationalize. She's trying to think it through. She's trying to whatever. But the spiritual deception was there that she entertained and it took her over. But it shows that she was trying to at least have some kind of dialogue because common sense will resist the futile attempt of darkness to overcome light. It resists it. But the wicked teachers will push, push, push hard enough. And if you don't maintain your common sense, they're going to take over. So she stayed there entertaining the stuff until she got taken over. But common sense was what was active, which is why she got into this dialogue, this back and forth kind of thing. Because common sense was at work. It was thinking it was helping her. But she gave in. Because it sounded nice and fancy. But this Lamb of God cannot possibly be your one-year-old sacrifice. Hear this? Can I possibly be your every man sacrifice, lamb for every house sacrifice? For another reason, because if he is called a lamb in the New Testament, he should not have been crucified for your sins, your transgressions, because even if he is referred to as a lamb to tell or expose some qualities about him or how the creator feels about him. Does that mean he is the actual one who should actually die? Because to be called a lamb does not necessarily mean you are a physical lamb. These are just allegories being used. So if he is called a lamb, 
you still need a real physical lamb that the Creator made from the book of Genesis when he made the animals. You need one of those. Yeah? Don't that make sense to you? Because then in that case, and every Israelite in Jerusalem could have brought one for the Romans to string them up on the cross if you still wanted your heathen Romans to string them up and push nails into them. But even that would be a problem, right? Why isn't your Israelite priest interested in crucifying your lambs at Calvary in Jerusalem in AD 33 or so? I mean, it just don't make no sense. No Israelite priest stepped up in Jesus' time and said to the Romans, we got to do this ourselves. You can't let your soldiers nail up our sacrifice. We'll kill him ourselves. That way you get what you want. You're still killing him, the king of the Jews that you feel threatened by. You're still getting him out of the way. You're still getting him dead. But we'll actually do the death. We'll kill him. Because our laws, our rules say we've always done this and that's the instruction and we should do the sacrifice. That way, if you're washing your hand, you'll really be free of it because you didn't actually drive the death nail. So now, just because he is called a lamb does not mean you do not need a physical lamb. Look at this here. From the book of Jeremiah, chapter 12 and verse 9. Mine heritage is unto me as a speckled bird. The birds round about are against her. Come ye, assemble all the beasts of the field, come to devour. So here the Mosah is calling his people, Israel, a speckled bird. And all the other birds around, like the other nations that hate her, they're coming in for the kill and so on, and they're taking advantage and they're coming down to, you know, take this bird out. The church of Israel, his nation. But just because he says they are a bird doesn't mean bringing themselves as a pigeon to be offered up in a sacrifice. When they're offering a pigeon a bird, they didn't offer up another Israelite to be killed as human sacrifice. Look at this here in Genesis chapter 15 verse 9. Well, verse 8. And he said, Most high power, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? And he said unto him, Take ye me an heifer of three years old, and a she-goat of three years old, and a ram and three years of three years old, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Notice that? He's not being told to take um, anybody from his caravan, from his tribal people that he's moving around with, and his family, and so on, and his warriors that were always with him, his soldiers that were always with him. He's not using them to offer up a sacrifice. He gets the real physical creatures. So he took the ram and turtle dove and pigeons and so on, right? Verse 10, And he took unto him all these and divided them in the midst and laid each piece one against another, but the birds divided he not. When the fowls came down, blah, blah, blah. So now, the Mosai says Israel is a speckled bird. But when it comes time for sacrifice, Israel does not bring, the ones who couldn't afford lamb or goat, didn't bring an, another Israelite, like an Israelite child, as a, as a bird to come and offer up. No, they got a physical pigeon. So if Jesus is the Lamb of Calvary, when it came time for the crucifixion, why didn't they get a physical Lamb to be offered up on Calvary? To keep in line with the precepts of the Old Testament that showed a physical Lamb was offered up. Because to call Jesus a, 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 a lamb of Calvary and then string him upon the cross is not to crucify a physical lamb on Calvary. It is to crucify a man that is referred to as a lamb. Just the same way as if I would say what they did on Calvary was to crucify a man, a human being named Jesus Christ that was born of Mary and Joseph. In other words, I'm trying to tell you, they did human sacrifice for the salvation of Israel under the hands of the Romans. And you are believing in this Messiah who did a human sacrifice that the Most High does not agree with? You're talking about 
Abraham and his son, and, and he got stopped by the angel. Isn't the Most High then telling you that he doesn't want this human sacrifice? So he said, I've provided you a ram right there caught in the thicket. He stopped the human sacrifice of Isaac because he does not want Abraham to go that far. But Israelites went on in New Testament times and killed a man that they say is the Messiah. And no Hebrew camp or person who believes in Jesus as the Messiah, who is a Hebrew, will admit to themselves because of a confused mind that a man, a physical man, was crucified. Just like today, you say, yeah, 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 you my dog, you my dog, ruff, ruff. But you don't mean that that person is your physical dog that you give dog food to in a silver bowl in your house. You just mean it's your, your comrade, your good buddy, your good friend, and you're tight and whatever, and, you, you know, you do stuff together and whatever, right? You probably work together and or whatever. You hang out together. But he's not your physical dog. So we find there is no one euro sacrifice at Calvary. No one year lamb offered up at Calvary. Jesus wasn't one year old when he was offered up. But a lamb would more say, hey, I'm one year old. I'm ready. You can offer me. And and as long as he's, he's kosher, he's without blemish and so on, then he's fine. And we also find there that heathens are offering up the sacrifice and so on and so forth. And we also find that no Israelite brought their own Jesus or their own lamb of Calvary. So they were disobedient in following the instructions of Exodus chapter 12. So they're breaking Torah while trying to fulfill a sacrifice based on Torah. How shitty is that? What we find for sure at Calvary is that a human being was sacrificed. And people are out there refusing to acknowledge and accept to their own mind in a common sense kind of manner that a physical man was nailed up on a cross. Probably ran about his wrist era, uh, like they say, or somewhere there, right? A physical man was crucified, not like the other men that were crucified by the Romans. They would crucify hundreds and thousands of them, sometimes in a day, till they ran out of trees in some areas. But they were crucified for political reasons and war and so on. But this man, Jesus, was crucified for religious reasons, for the sacrifice of, of uh, taking care of the sins of Israel. And some say for the whole world. And you don't want to, in a common sense way, accept that that was human sacrifice. Israelites participated in human sacrifice and participate to this day in 2017 in a human sacrifice belief. And you tell me you're not pagan? It was human sacrifice where a man that you say is a messiah from the tribe of Judah was killed 